Uh, thank you guys for inviting me here. I am like, I got goosebumps, you know, just being here. It's been a long time I've been in Europe and I t truly miss Europe. And, and here in the Netherlands, it's like, I feel so welcome. I don't even want to go back home. <laughs> um, as you can see, um, using your superpowers for good to change the world. Um, so, my first hand on a computer was an IBM punch card machine. I was 16, 17 years old. And I was like, I was like, oh! It's like, I, I, I want to learn this so bad. It was so easy. And so, um, my mother wanted me to become a designer. Um, I, cause I was like 5'11", everything couldn't fit me and I would make, my mother taught me how to sew and I would make all my clothes. And so I would, you know, I would see something in Vogue magazine and I would design it and then I would make it. And so I told my mother I didn't want to be a designer, I wanted to be a computer programmer. And she was like, why? I was like, and back then it was like because, I, didn't, I mean, I just wanted to do it because I just, it was something different for me, and it felt, it just felt wonderful for me. It was, you know, it was like that energy you have when you, you know, finish up a code and it's, it's awesome, it worked, and you be like, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and so, from there, um, my mother couldn't help me, couldn't get, help me, couldn't get into college. Um, we're talking, I don't want to tell you how old I am, you already know. <laughs> But it was old and it was at a point where it wasn't easy to get into college. So I got pregnant and got married and my husband joined the military. And while in the military, um, I had two kids, well three kids. One I had in Germany and the other two I had along the way. Um, and so while I was, he was in the military, um, I got tired of retail, so I was working part-time in retail, and I wanted to find a job where I didn't have to work weekends. I wanted to be home with my kids. My husband was always gone. And so I decided to go to a local military college and took two college, well, two, two college courses on MS-DOS and D-Base. And everybody know how old that is. <laughs> and so I learned how to do MS-DOS D-Base. I put it on my resume. And I got a job at the local bank in Richmond, Virginia. And so I didn't have a college degree. All I had was that those two college courses on my resume. And I got a job as a database programmer. So I worked in a small office where they did a lot of, um, you, you put all this data in to generate all these reports on paper. And then I would distribute them out. So, I was doing, while I was doing that, I realized that right down the hall was the customer service office. And all these women were you know, on the phone handling people um, accounts over the phone. For you to work in that office, you had to have a college degree. And I was like, now I just realized something that nobody else did. And I made more money than them. So I realized, I said, okay, so did I really need a college degree to, to, to be in computers? So I, the job was, oh, I love the job so much. And I was like, I didn't want to leave. And my husband said, hey, we're going to Germany. I'm like, no, 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 we ain't going back to Germany. <laughs> and so he's like, no, we got to go back to Germany. So I had to quit that job and we moved to Germany. And we was in Wiesbaden, Germany. And so while there, I worked at, um, on the military base with the soldiers with help their support. So I did a lot of work perfect. Um, if you, if you remember Word Perfect from back in the day and some other stuff. And so I would also buy, they used to have a, like a yard sale. Military always have a yard sale, getting rid, getting rid of old furniture, getting rid of old computers. They had the old computers, the old floppy drive computers. This one right here on the screen. And um, I actually took those computers, and I had about four of them, and I took them apart. And I put them together, put, okay, this one worked with this one, this one worked with this one, and I put it all together and got them working again. And I had two computers in my house. And I was like, it just, it was just the, the intrigue, it just, computers intrigued me more and more and more. And I think at that, I was at 25, maybe 26 at that time, when I started to get interested in that. Um, my, when we, 
once I did that, um, we, my husband decided he wanted to get out the military. I said, no, I don't want to get out the military. But he wanted to get out the military. I didn't want to leave Germany. We had to leave Germany. And so we flew back to the United States. And we moved to Atlanta. And I still have my, um, my skills with building computers. So what I did, I started a little small business. So I would, a lot of people at the time didn't know shit about computers. So basically, I would go to the house, teach them how to work their software, install software, install modems, and install printers with drivers. I mean, that's what my little, my little hustle was on the side. And so while I was doing that, there was one company that I was like, I found out there was a company, a computer company in Atlanta that support, they, they built their own proprietary software for pharmaceutical companies. And I was like, I want to work for them. I mean, I, I say, they say, like, well, the only, the only shift they had was third shift, which was like, what was it, like from four to 12. And I was like, and I had three kids, and I was like, I don't care, I want to work for this company, because it was the only company that I, could get, I wanted to work with that had all the knowledge of working on computers, proprietary software, laptops, help to support everything. And so while I was working with them, I learned HTML. So that dumb, HTML for Dummies was my favorite book in the world. I taught, I mean, that book fell apart as much times as I went through it. I actually created a web page called African American Literary Form. The web page was based from Amazon. So back in the day, we're talking about, uh, I'll say, late 90s, early 2000s. Amazon sucked. You search for anything in Amazon, you got, what the hell, I didn't want that. You know, I want this. And so Amazon didn't make it easy to search for books. So what I would do is, my daughter kept asking for books that could relate to her. And I was like, okay, the best thing I could do, so what I do is search it in Amazon. So I would search all these books, and then I would save the link. And so, and then I started linking the book to the, the web page for myself. So when the holidays come, or if I, or her birthday come, I would buy her some books based on the link from my website. Well, people found the page. I don't know how. It wasn't for them to find, it was for me to use. So people started, um, authors, um, black authors started sending me books and asking me to put their books on my page. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I wasn't getting paid, but they, I mean, I had like, like maybe four shelves of books that people was give, they just sent to me. And so I, so I reached out to my husband and my kids. I said, yo, I said, listen, yo, okay, I need a favor from y'all. You know, and they was like, what, what, you know, what you want, mom? I was like, well, the page is getting bigger than me, and I can't, you know, keep up with it. Would y'all be interested in learning code and helping mom? And he's like, no. Oh, like, well, thank you. And so I had to let the website go. And so back then, I didn't even know it was code. You know, so I started learning um, Oracle for, I mean, SQL for Oracle. Um, I started learning C, C++. Um, and then um, what happened was um, um, I, got, I left that job, and I started working for an environmental company. And I didn't, I mean, I was working in computers because they didn't have nobody who was knowledgeable in the office to know, have computer experience. So whenever they had a computer problem, they came to me. It was network problems, software problems, how to set up the internet. I mean, everything came to me. If they wanted me to kind of do something illegal on some documents, it was me they came to. <laughs> so, um, and during that time while I was working with them, um, Apple came out with their iPad, and I was like, yes, I'm like, man. I was an Apple fanatic by this time, because I had to convince my husband that Apple was worth buying because he thought it was too much goddamn money. So what I did was, let me, I snuck this in real quick. So, so this is what I did. I bought me an iMac, right? And he was like, why you bought that iMac? You know it's too much money. I was like, no, 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 it's not too much money. No, 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 I can tell you what it can do. So I bought this little adapter, and I had him hook up his cassette player. You know, the, the, the big cassette player back in the day? I had him connected up, and he put a cassette tape in, and then recorded his music onto the computer. And he was like, all right, you good. 
<laughs> so, so during that time, I said, so I started to get more into Apple. And so we were standing online at the Apple store, and um, I met this 16-year-old boy. And I was like, and I was like, dude, how you get $800 to buy an iPad? You know, you wash some cars, work at Burger King. And he was like, no, no, um, I build an app. I was like, really? Also, so you went to Harvard, Stanford, you know, Yale? He said, no, I went to YouTube. And I was like, I said, hey, babe, I want to do what he do. So my husband then tells me um, a year later, find a school. Find out how you could be an iOS developer. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, and I was like, he said, well, you know, this is what you want to do? I said, yeah, that's what I want to do. So I started doing my research. First person, first people I call is Big Nerve Ranch. They were, I was like, wow, Big Nerve Ranch is in Atlanta. They have a crash course, two weeks. I said, ooh, it has hotel on there. I'm in Atlanta. Well, maybe I can call them up and convince them to just sell me the course without the hotel room. And they was like, no. So I was like, damn. So I did, my, did more research, felt, um, found a, um, a group um, in Atlanta called Atlanta, Atlanta iOS Developers Group. I reached out to a bunch of people on there, went back and forth for a couple of months, found um, a tutor or two, um, and started learning um, iOS, Objective-C, from Big Nerf Ranch book. And so um, he wasn't a very good tutor, but eventually I, you know, I didn't let him de deter me because I was, this hard, I was very hard-headed. It's like, you know, people would say, you can't do it. I'm like, oh, hell no, let me show you what I can do, god damn it. You know? And so um, I went ahead and I learned it. I still I didn't feel comfortable with what I have learned, learned with Objective-C. So in 2013, there was a boot camp that reached out to the group, the iOS developers group in Atlanta, and they were selling a boot camp course, 90 days for $125. Sister jumped on that. And so I did the course, and when I started learn doing the course, I was like, oh shit, I know this. And it felt so good to know it. And, and I was like, so every morning when my husband went to work at five o'clock in the morning, I was in front of that computer learning Objective-C. No joke. So I knew what time my husband came home, I would stop making his dinner, Make sure, you know, his dinner's cooked? Yeah, his dinner's cooked. Okay, good, we good. Let me make sure he got some lunch. And so, okay. And then he gets back home, and he gets on. I say, hey, babe, how you doing? Babe, you all right? Yeah, them people at my job just drive me goddamn crazy. They getting on my damn nerves. I said, babe, don't worry about it. Here's your dinner, sweetie. Every morning, I did that consecutively for three months. When I got to, when I got to December, um, I finished the course, and my tutor said, Alicia, you know what you can do? You should build an app for domestic violence. And I started crying because domestic violence is, is very huge in my family. And I, have a, and I was dealing with the fact that I was a child of domestic violence. My mom was victim, my aunt, um, my daughters are victims, and my girlfriend died from domestic violence. And so, when I started to build the app, I had to realize how I'm going to build this app. How do I want it to look? Why am I building this app? How important it is? Is it important for me to build it for victims? Is it necessary? And so when I was going through all of that, again, I had to say, okay, the first thing was is what I was going to put into this app. That was the first thing that I had to understand. What's the first thing I need to put into this app? Okay, so they need to know, find a local shelter. Okay, so the problem is with, when in, um, in the United States is that, well, Google, um, you cannot search for a shelter. So explain that to somebody who's trying to help me, who the tutor was. Like, so I was like, well, you know, you can't do geolocation or maps on the shelter. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. No, you can't. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. No, you can't. The address, there is no address for shelters. Why? Because abusers is going to come to the location and try to do 
serious harm. And not only to the victim, but other people there. So I had to hard code all that in there. Every shelter had to be hard coded in there. People thought I was crazy. It was like, you had to do that? Well, I don't understand, because there's only the name of the location, the name of the shelter, the city, the state, and the telephone number. That's it. So when I was building this app, and as you can see, it was so pretty. The first name was the Purple Pocketbook. And the reason why I call it the Purple Pocketbook is because purple is the color for domestic violence. And if you, under, if you know pocketbook, purse, you know, um, bag, um, it's women, like my grandmother, she had this huge, huge pocketbook. And she had extra bags along with it. And so she, my grandmother had everything in that bag, birth certificate, passport, driver's license. She had her makeup in there. And I was like, Grandma, why you need all that shit? She said, you never know. You never know you're in a special little location and you have to look good. And so that's why I call it the Purple Pocketbook. And as you can see, the design. And the reason why I made that design, because men look at this and they see pocketbooks, they're going to just, they're going to say, I don't want to look at this app. It's for women. It's to deter, to deter the abuser away from even bothering to look for this app. So the first side, this side right here, is the old version. So I had to change the name because I was infringing on another company. And theirs was called, they had a non, a non was it a nonprofit um, foundation called the Purple Purse. And they contacted me and said, you're infringing, we need you to change the name. So that's where PIVO came along, which was Purple Evolution. And so I'm, make, I'm doing all this with the app, and and realizing what domestic violence is doing, why I had to do this. So as you can see, it's listed by shelters. The law, because domestic violence, you have, the law for domestic violence is different in every state. None of it's the same. For example, um, let's say in Georgia, in the United States, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, there is a law for unemployment, women who are victims of domestic violence and unemployment. One woman had fought it up all the way up to the state Supreme Court, where if, she, if her company knows that she is a victim of domestic violence, they have to pay her unemployment, and she won. So that's the standard now in the state of Georgia. If, she does it, if a woman do not notify her employer, then she cannot collect it. They have to be aware of it. In other states, that's not a law, okay? Um, then you have, and so we also had Im Im immigration. While Obama was in office, a woman could apply for asylum based on her being in an abusive relationship. That's no longer in place no more. Um, staying safe, and the reason why we, I said we use the staying safe is because a woman has to strategically plan her exit out of an abusive relationship. And a lot of people have this mindset where they say, well, why can't she just get out? And I tell them, this is what I tell everybody, because I had to find out this for myself, because that's just the same thing. And so I said, if you're in a bank, and, you, and since you're in the bank, bank robbers come in, you're going to run out. If you run out, they're going to shoot you. You have to strategically plan your exit while you're in the bank with bank robbers. The same thing will apply to her. And, um, and you have to see it in that way because it's not something that is easily done. Then I had the quiz put in there. And the reason why I had the quiz put in there is because there's a lot of women who don't believe that they're in an abusive relationship. And, you know, and it don't have to be... Um, it don't have to be abuse, it could be monetary, you know, and a lot of people can don't, you know, don't realize that's a huge, huge difference. And so when I build this out, this is, this is how I really focus on doing it. I had to not only be the abuser, I had to be the victim. And I had to think low down, dirty, sneaky, what would he do kind of way, where I was like, as a victim, what do I need to know? You know, so like I tell people, I said, man, I used to, <laughs> I did some dirty shit back in the day. So when I wanted to find out about somebody and they got on my nerves, I did a serious background check on them, 
found out where they live, how many children they have, who they were married to before and after, and basically harassed them. I was dirty. But that was because they were messing with me, so I had to, that was the only way to get back at them. <laughs> so when, um, when I think about domestic violence, a lot of people don't also think about the stats. And so this is like, this is the very most, most important part about domestic violence. It's known as statistics. So it's like three, the number of women murdered every day by a current or former male partner in the U.S. So I'm talking about just the U.S., okay? One in seven, the number of men who will be victims of severe violence by an in, um, intimate partner in their lifetime. So a lot of people say, oh, men are not victims. Oh, yeah, men are victims. Men are victims of domestic violence. But the thing is, men don't report it as much as women because it's more embarrassing. And I don't give a damn. If a woman beating you up, shit, tell. Mm -hmm. She need to go to jail, too. Um, 25, the percentage of physical assaults perpetrated against women that are reported to be to re reported to the police annually. So a woman, I know of women who are being um, harassed and stalked and, and guess what? Um, computers, the internet um, is the main thing that they track us, you know? So, I mean, I know women, I know a woman who, she stayed off the grid because the guy she was dating works for the government and he knows how to find her. You know, so these are the things that a lot of people need to know about when it comes down to statistics. <coughs> so, while I was building the app, um, I had some problems submitted to Apple. Apple gave me hell submitting it. I had finished the app in March, and I had the hardest time trying to get it to pass Apple's approval. And so, when I was building the app, and I thought that the um, Atlanta iOS developers group, which was a large percentage of them, was helping me. They didn't quite help me because, you know, when they looked at it, it was like, okay, we don't see what the problem is. And so I went to one of the Women of Code events back in, I think it was April. I was supposed to do a hackathon um, with several of the women for AT&T, because AT&T had this huge hackathon, and I was supposed to go and help them out. Um, one of the, I told one of the girls, I said, listen, her name is Stephanie Brown. Stephanie Brown, I said, Stephanie, girl, I'm having this problem. <sighs> my, app, my app is not going through. I don't understand. And she's like, well, Lisa, let's go to Starbucks and sit down. Let's go through it. So she said, we can go through the Apple form, and we can see what they have in there. Maybe they can, you know, going through it, we can find out. So what I did, we sat down at Starbucks, found out that I needed to change. The screen size was bigger, and they needed to be smaller. I'm like, no shit. And so I was like, so I ran home. My husband was in Charlottesville, was in, I think in Virginia, Charlottesville, Virginia at the time. So I stayed up, I couldn't go to the hackathon. I stayed up to about one, two o'clock in the morning, finished up resizing the app and everything, and then submitted it to Apple. May 2nd, Apple approved it. Once, I mean, that right there made me say, I love women of color. This woman had no cold experience. She didn't even have to help me. But she found the time to sit with me and say, let's go through it and find and try to troubleshoot it and bring it down. And after that, I was addicted to Women of Code. So I created a group on Women of Code called the Women iOS Developers Group. So I was helping other women learn Objective-C. No, that wasn't fun either. Because for some reason, women got the, the women I was trying to help they kept bringing damn Dell laptops. I'm like, dude, you can't use Dell laptop to learn iOS. And so, well, can't you install the software? No, it don't work that way. So I had to like, you know, you know it, a lot of women came and go um, because they didn't, you know, it was just too much. You know, Apple products was expensive. And so, and I wasn't learning, no, teaching nobody no Java, JavaScript because I wasn't ready for that yet. And so, um, I became, I got involved with Women of Code, and it's been, it was an amazing opportunity. And so while I was working with Women of Code, um, my, one of the directors came to me and said, hey, Alicia, Apple has, um, you know, Apple got the, the big keynote, um, big event every Ju um, June. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She said, well, they, they want to know if you're interested in going. I said, hell yeah, I ain't got no goddamn kids. Hell, I'll go to California. And so um, she said, well, 
you know, so they emailed me, my, the Women of Code um, CEO emailed me and said, okay, Alicia, um, I add you to the list, and so and we'll see what happens. So Apple reached out to me and said, do you have an app? I said, yeah, I have an app. And he said, okay, so I said, it's in iTunes, and I sent her the link to it and everything. And so the next thing I know, I got full scholarship for 2015 um, WWDC. And so I'm up there going, <sighs> My husband going like this, <laughs> and I say, "Hey, you ain't go, you ain't got no ticket." He said, "I'm going. When, I don't care what you say." So he got to go with me because you know they give you a hotel. Um, he didn't get the tickets to go to the um, to the, all the little events or the keynote, but he was there with me. And so while I was there, no, before I got there, see the T-shirt up there. It says, "Thanks WWC for getting me a scholarship for the WWDC 15." I took a picture of it, just like you see right there. I emailed everybody, from Women to Code, Apple, anybody, my family, I remember, I was so excited. Apple then looked for me at the scholarship event. My husband was talking to them about, he said, we understand that your wife created a domestic violence app. And I was like, yeah, she's like, and so she's in there into the little session. So when I came out, I was so excited. They said, well, Alicia, we would love for you to just, you know, Stand online, you know, for, in the keynote where all the rest of the crazy people do first thing four, five o'clock in the morning. They try to get the front, get the front seat. I was like, man, that's kind of early, don't you think? <laughs> they said, well, you know, if you could just be there, we just want to take a picture of you. And I was like, okay, all right, we can do it. So this is what happened. I got to go and says Apple Live, June 8th, 2015, Alicia C. learned the code at 51 and made an app to help victims of domestic violence. I was the, that's the first time, the first black woman that ever showed up on 2015 Keynote, okay? And the first woman they actually put a name to. People found me though. For some reason, some, I had some women, some women, a couple of women found me from this picture. And I don't know how, because it, it didn't have a full name on it. And so this was an amazing picture. I was so excited, you, you couldn't tell me nothing. You know, and so, and then when I walked in, the, my face was plastered up on the high screen and everybody was like, that's you, let me take a picture, let me take a picture. I got a friend from South Korea who's my best friend. <laughs> got a, I got a 17-year-old friend from Austria, you know. Um, I mean, so these are the people I met along the way. I was, it was so exciting. I'm like, all these youngins like me, why are they like me? So from there, the, the following year, I get an email from a documentary company saying, my name is Alicia. Okay, she spelled it different. And um, I work with this documentary company and a tech company reached out to us and they wanted us to reach out to you to see, you know, we want to get some information about you. I was like, okay. I said, you know what, I'm gonna call up this woman and see if she's real. So I called her up and we started talking. And um, she was saying that there's a tech company to have this thing and I, it didn't, at that time, so, I didn't know who the hell they were. It could have been anybody, and she could have been some bullshit. So it ain't bother me. So what I said, I said, okay. So we started talking, she recorded me. Then she wanted to do a Skype. Then she wanted me to send a picture of everybody in my family. Then she's like, oh, Alicia, I'm coming down to Atlanta. Why? And she's like, well, we wanna, I wanna do a personal interview with you, meet your family, your husband, your girlfriends, anybody else. So I said, okay. So. She then, um, she then came down to Atlanta and she did all of that. And then she was waiting for an answer from the director and they didn't, you know, they just told her, you know, right now we're just gonna wait. And she was like, Alicia, and I was hoping that they'll say yes, but apparently they said they're gonna wait. I'm like, cool, cause I damn sure don't want y'all recording me. And I was cool with that. So in the meantime, my life was going on. I was at Google I.O. and having a good time at Google I.O. And so, um, and this was like 2016. And so I get a call while the keynote was about to start. And it was, and they were saying, Alicia, we're coming to Atlanta. What do you mean you're coming to Atlanta? Well, we're gonna do, we're gonna do the whole, we're gonna do a video on you. So we, um, we're coming to Atlanta. Um, we need for you to do, you know, find you some friends. I say, we need to find you some friends. You need to get a barbecue started. We need a location to film. I said, okay, so in Atlanta, Georgia, School starts in August, okay? Not in September, 
School starts in August. School ends in May. All the kids are already gone. Parents don't take their damn kids away, saying they don't want to take care of them no more, like I said before. Take care of their kids no more. So they, they, you know, they take their kids to their grandparents' house or sister's house. And I was explaining to her, I said, well, I, I hate to disappoint you, but a lot of my friends are already going to be gone. And she was like, well, you know, what can we do? You know, in California, their kids are still around. I said, like, well, this is Georgia. It's totally different from California. I know you'll be going to school over there, but these kids don't go to school here. And so she's like, okay, no problem. So in the meantime, my app had to be iOS, the current iOS system. So I was fucked. That was it for me. Oh, it was over. And I was like, I was crying because I made the mistake of adding Swift into my Objective-C code, and then everything was crashing. And I was like, Everybody said, oh, Alicia, it worked. You ain't gonna have no problem adding Swift to Objective-C. No, that was a damn lie. You, they, they screwed me up. And so um, Apple assigned a developer to help me. And that was like, I was, at this point, I was already emotionally drained. And, she, and I called him up and I was like, I was like, dude, this is not working. It's not, I mean, I'm having this problem with it. And I was crying. He was like, Alicia. Calm down. I'm on the plane right now. I'll be in Atlanta tonight. And the next morning, he was at my house, at my computer, helping me fix my app. Apple will not, they didn't, they would not let me not have my shit together. Okay. We fixed the app. It still was half-assed. We got it working, submitted it to Apple that Friday. It was approved Memorial Day. Apple had somebody come in to approve that damn app. I told my husband, oh, I said, hey, babe, no shit, look at this. See, he approved my app. Um, then they drove me crazy with doing the video. So they took me into the heart of Atlanta, had me walk up and down the street. I thought I was in the um, Housewives of Atlanta show. I, swear, God, I was like, ooh, I can't do this. And, you know, they was like, okay, eat the breakfast. Okay, put the computer right here. Okay, okay, so no, 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 um, have the kids run around. Okay, stop the kids right now. I was like... Yo, I was like, okay, okay, Alicia, we, we can't go to the gym. Let's walk up and down the street. And I got my neighbors looking at me like, why are you walking down the street with a bunch of camera people following you? And it's like, I was like, and then I was like, oh, I, oh, I look like a hot mess. Oh. So through all of this, this is what happened. Um, this is the video. Hello. computer that I coded on. In the beginning, my biggest challenge was not having access to a computer. The first line of code I wrote was bouncing ball. It would bounce around the screen, hit the edges, and then come back again. I think the first one was like a, a to-do list. It was a to-do list. I remember the first time I did it when it worked, and it was like magical. I can do anything with code. Anything I can think about, I can do it. In Beirut, to experience power outages every day. So uh, let me see if I can just do a simple algorithm that can provide the electricity cut of time. It shouldn't cost life to give life. But if we compress all these health guidelines into small movies. I am one person that saw a problem and created a solution to stop or assist a woman in domestic violence. What we wanted, what we needed, didn't exist. So at some point, you just say, okay, well, let's do it ourselves. Let's make an app. Well, when I first start an app, I have to have a plan. We start with that little glimmer, that seed of a new, fresh idea. Mm -hmm. There's this fear of code, like it's so hard or it's inaccessible, but actually it's not. Someone who doesn't even know code at all, if they really studied some simple Swift code, they would probably be able to understand it. Anything's possible, and it all comes from that first step. Launching out was a big moment, actually. I told everyone about it. I'm like, download my app, it's on the App Store. 
I was dancing. I called all my girlfriends that I cried to. It's such a crazy feeling because it's so many emotions, so many wishes, so many dreams. I always tell my students, do you have Beirut electricity? My son made it, <laughs> he built it. And the girls, uh, is he single? <laughs> By the end of 2016, one million women will have a safe birth due to the Safe Delivery app. If people come together in public spaces, it creates a kind of happiness and it creates a kind of like healing effect for the soul. Don't touch my coat! <laughs> Dear Kira, young people like you are tomorrow's leaders. You inspire me and give me tremendous hope for the future. Michelle and I wish you all the best. Sincerely, Barack Obama. These tools are something that we desperately need when trying to change the world. I think the more people who can learn to code, learn to build apps, the more problems can be solved. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm creating stuff that can actually change the way people live, which is super awesome. I want to beat this amazing, amazing code is off the, the chain, chain senior developer, developer where, where everybody, everybody comes to me and is like, yeah, can you do this? this? And I'm like, yeah. yeah. I'm like, now go in there and just like, type up the code and, and blah, blah, blah. Damn, damn. Yeah. I'm like, wow, you can do this. Yay. <laughs> And I could tell you that's how I really felt when I was coding. And I get goosebumps every time I see this video. So what happened was that once the, once the video was finished, they decided that the end part, they was going to use that end part and put everything in front of it, because they love my laughter. And I thought that was like, that's a crazy laugh for you to just follow, to try to build a video on my laugh. And then um, what was crazy was when like, it was that Friday, and the keynote was going to be the following Monday, and it was like, okay, um, Alicia, we're not going to use the video unless you approve it. I'm like, man, I done, so, so, I mean, I done signed my life to you. Why the hell you need me to approve this damn video? I done, I done signed everything over, and it's like, well, it came from the top. And so I, they sent me an email with the password, then they sent me another email with the video, and I seen the video, I cried, and then I laughed. And then they said they wanted a verbal. So I, so I figured they would take my email, like, no, you have to call us up and tell us that it, you approved it. And I'm like, well, goddamn, what else you need from me? And so um, I got, when that video came, my phone blew up. There was people at that keynote was wondering where the hell I was at, because this was, you were supposed to be here when this video came out. And I was like, well, I couldn't tell nobody. They told me if I tell them, but they killed me. So, <laughs> so Apple basically, um, um, they gave me another ticket last year, 2017, so I got to go again for free because of the video. And so um, it was exciting doing the video. I said I would never do it again, but I made a mistake with doing another video. So I was at O'Reilly Conference, um, when was it? I think it was last year, 2017. And I did this, this talk um, at O'Reilly Conference. And GitHub came to me and said, you, had amazing, you got an amazing story. We don't know women your age who taught themselves how to code. And I was like, OK, well, you know, I'm just a unique breed. There's some out there. And like, no, no, you, you got to understand. You're a unicorn. You know, I was like, OK, I got you, a black unicorn. I got you. <laughs> OK. And so they said, well, let's do, we would like to do a video on you called I Am a Developer. And I was like, cool. So they came out in, I believe, July. And then they did this video. My name is Alicia Licky Carr, and I am 54 years old. I have three grown children, and then I have eight grandbabies. And me and my husband have been married 36 years. My granddaughter, um, she turns 13 this year. Daya didn't know what I do. So there was one day she just happened to say, Grandma, you know nothing about tech. And I was like, excuse me? Did you say I don't know nothing about tech? Google Grandma name. Google Grandma name. When you finish Google Grandma name, call me back. About two hours later, she called me back and said, Grandma, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you knew all this stuff.
I was getting my second generation iPad. Met this 16 year old boy. He said, I learned how to create an app off of YouTube. And I turned to my husband and said, that's what I wanted to do. I took the Objective-C course, learned in 90 days, and that's when the mentor told me, you know, maybe you should consider doing a domestic violence app. I started crying because my daughters, my mother, my aunts, all were victims of domestic violence. I mean, I would tell any woman of color, just put your hands on something that is in technology. I'm telling my grandkids, you can do anything you want, so be creative and do something that you enjoy. Grandma's doing something that she enjoyed in her life because I want them to have that opportunity to say, you do, do everything you want to do. This is what I would love to see an engineer look like if a woman, fine as hell, dressed to look like she's there to impress and not be discriminated against. I am Alicia Carr. I am a grandmother, a mentor, a nerd, an activist, I am a developer. So GitHub gave me this video. It's mine. <laughs> so before I get into the last part of my presentation, the one thing I have to say, and I think a lot of people, I, I don't, normally I don't want y'all asking me any questions at the end. I want to make sure I give y'all all the answers, okay? The reason why I'm doing this. Um, let's say this. This is not what I was expecting to do. This is not what I was expecting to see my life take me. I was expected to build an app, put it on my resume, and get a job. I'm good, I was good at transitioning from one job to another job to another job. I was very naive to think that with the skill sets that I learned that I was going to be able to get a job like within the next couple of months from the time I built it. It didn't happen that way. Um, Women of Code, I volunteered Women of Code for two years, became director of Women of Code, um, giving back to the community. Um, Apple gave me the acknowledgement. Um, going out and speaking about how it's important for women to, be, to learn the code. The, the te let's say this, tech jobs, there's so many damn tech jobs out there right now. Ain't no woman gonna take your job. Women should be added to your job. Because there's such a need for um, people to learn more about technology, not just women, but minorities. And the opportunity is there. And me, when I built that app, everywhere I went, I was being questioned on my ability. And you know, I didn't think about it that way, and then it, it hit me, it said, maybe because I'm too old. You don't want no 55-year-old woman. Maybe they don't want no woman. And maybe I'm just too black, you know. And so it got, I mean, so in my mind, that's what I was going through. And to the point where um, I just decided that I was going to stop looking because it became a, a serious depression for me. You know, um, imposter syndrome seemed to seep into my, my, in, into my mind, and it was killing me. It, it, it was really draining me. To the, and so I decided that, I said, I'm not going to even bother. I'm not going to do this no more. I'm not going to let them depress me. I'm not going to look. So creating the app and doing, speaking on domestic violence and speaking on as a woman in technology and as a woman who taught herself to code and showing people that, one, you don't need a college degree. Forgive me for saying that for those who have that. I ain't mad at you. But I, I'm talk, I've been talking to some women who are saying that they have that degree, that computer science degree, but they can't get a job because they don't have enough coding experience. So they pay for, uh, one of my friends paid for a two-year college degree and she couldn't get a job. So it took another year or two before she can build her portfolio to say that she had the experience to do what she wanted to do. So, you know, we're, and, and working with Women of Code, this is what I was saying. We had women who say, I want to code. And then, you know, they had to start from scratch. And, and they started working in the tech field by doing help desk support. Once they learned how to code, they got an internship. Once they did that, then they got a job. That, you know, one of the girls, um, it took her two years. But still, those are what these women wanted. And the thing is, is the opportunity, I'm, I'm finding out that there's companies who are starting to realize if they want to fill these positions, they're going to have to take the necessary steps to do internships. 
or bringing back mo mothers or women back into the workforce by giving them an opportunity to learn how to code, you know, and having the flexibility, you know. And so, don't get me wrong, I love what I do. I love speaking to people like you out here. I want to make, I want, if I can change one person's mind to think that there's an opportunity for me to help a woman or help a person of color or a minority, that's an opportunity for you all to make a change in this world right now. My goal is a social cause. And my social, me, me being in the tech field and me being this woman of color who taught herself how to code, there's so many of us out there that can do this. And they just, we just need that opportunity. And I, don't, I mean, I know there's some of y'all that, you know, may not think that women are special. I, it's all right. We understand, because I understand some of us are trifling. We understand that. But again, as I mean, y'all are our main allies. You know, y'all are our allies, and y'all are the ones that can, y'all the ones that can make a change in this community. Y'all the ones that can make a change in this community. So, my challenge, okay. When I was learning how to code, I felt, I felt alone. I, could, I, I was so afraid to ask for help because I didn't want to feel stupid. And the worst thing was, was that, first of all, when you're older like me, that's the first thing you're going to feel is stupid. You know, I, you know your youngest, your 20-year-olds, 25-year-olds, like, oh, yeah, I know this. <laughs> I know how to do this, you know, and you know, y'all got this, you know, y'all got this, um, you know, energy, it's like, yeah, and I, uh, that wasn't me, I was like, okay, um, let me, if I ask him, he gonna say, you should know this, and so over time, I found out that um, some of my friends who, who um, been doing code for years, she said, like, Alicia, we are, we, we like that too, we, we, we have, you know, you got to ask for help, all of us, you know, he said, all of us don't know everything, you know, even I have to have, you know, reach out for people for help. Um, being a child of domestic violence, I see my mother go through a lot. I see my aunts, I see my girlfriend died, and, um, and it was devastating for me. Um, my, my sister actually stabbed my stepfather to protect my moms, but my mother threw her out the house because she didn't want her to be there when my stepfather came back. So domestic violence, is, this is how domestic violence affects families. Um, being a woman of color at the age of 55, it was hard to accept that because I was this naive woman to think that that shit didn't matter when I was looking for a job. And my husband told me, you really, really kind of slow, babe, because you know, this is the real world. You ought to know that. And I'm like, but that's not, that they need people to fill the position. No, that's not how it works. And so I had to come to that realization. You know, when I was interviewing with some of the top 500 companies, the first thing they did was question my ability on how I built that app, when they would not have asked a man that question, for real. And once they asked me that question, I was like, okay, dude, you're talking about, you know, this is two years. I built this app in 2014, and you asked me, how do, I, how do I remember how to do localization? I, that's two years. I haven't even touched, I haven't touched localization in that app. I didn't need to. It's already done. You know? I said, I can Google it. And then another thing was a friend of mine said, well, Alicia, what would you have told them? I like, um, you know, to ask them, it's like, they should have asked you, would you have made any changes to it? Hell yeah, they made changes to localization. Because I learned, I know more now than I did back then. The next thing I'm working on is trying to make people a national app. I have had people from not only all over the world, but all over the United States asking me, is this app available in their city, their state? And I was like, sorry, no, and I'm not doing that shit by myself. It's, it's, it's draining, it's emotional, it's just too much for me to handle to make it national. So um, I decided to make it open source a couple, about two months ago. And that was hard for me. It was seriously hard for me because I thought that every man on earth were abusers. Then I realized, no, all the nerds in the world come nothing near that. They could never do anything like that. Nerds are nerds, and we kind, I kind of feel your pain, you know, you know. And I had this like, yeah, okay, I got you guys. <laughs> so, you know, with that, I realized that I need to open it up and have people help me. 
Um, being a social entrepreneur. Um, being told I was a social entrepreneur was different because I didn't know anything about it. And I didn't want to be a nonprofit. And I wanted to be, you know, somebody who goes out here and make a change and say, this is what I am and this is what I do. Um, I'm also an advocate and an activist speaking on not only for women in technology, not only for minorities or people of color, but I'm also speaking for those people who want to learn how to code and want that opportunity, and also speaking on domestic violence. There's not too many people in the tech world, and y'all ought to know this, the tech world, y'all got to understand this. When you talk about anything that has a domestic violence, sex trafficking, assault, um, harassment, technology is the number one thing they use to harass people. Seriously, and this is what I'm trying to get people to understand. This, this is how important it is. And we are the main people here that should understand that. Another thing I realized, I inspire a lot of goddamn people. Didn't know that. Didn't think about that. And I didn't realize that till maybe about a year ago. And I've been doing this for a little while. And so, um, finding out that not only do I inspire women, I inspire men too. I was like, that shit, that's good then. I like that. <laughs> I like to inspire men, shoot. And so, um, my, the people that, ask, people ask me how do, how do I, I'm able to stay where I'm at and stay strong and stay how I am. I have a huge, huge support system. I got a huge support system. And if you got something bad to say, I ain't got no time for your ass. I don't need you in my circle. I will drop you like a hot potato. I just don't. So, you know, my husband is like my biggest supporter. You know, if it wasn't for him, allowing me to quit my job, allowing me to learn how to code, allowing me to do the things I do, I wouldn't be here. My children, even though they get on my nerves, I love them, but they also my, my supporters as well. You know, they didn't cause me to have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes. Shoot, I may, have, may eventually have a heart attack because of them damn kids I got. <laughs> my grandbabies, I love my grandbabies. I love them. I want them all to be coders. But I don't think that's going to work real good, but I'm going to try my best. But they are inspiring for me. I didn't think I was going to have eight. I told my kids if they have one more child, I'm not counting them as grandchildren. <laughs> And my best friends, I have two good best friends that has been next to me for years. And um, like I said, if it wasn't for them, I don't know where I would be at right now, having this huge support system. The tech community is also my huge support system. I mean, y'all keep me going. You really do. And just having y'all listen to my story, and I'm like so inspired by y'all listening to my story. And I'm really, really thankful for that. So, you want to follow me? See, you see that tech girl? So, I, so let me tell you, I, I still be doing a little coding here and there, even though people say that's just the easy part of coding. I created a, a, a whole bunch of girls called tech girls. And as you can see, they talk code. Like one talk Ruby, one talk JavaScript, and the other one talk Python. And I created them because I wanted to see women like me of all colors, of all nationalities. I put it on iMessenger, and um, the women love it. They love it. And so I want to work a little bit more on it, but my husband's like, you ain't got no damn time to be trying to make them do other things with it, because if you want to do it, then you got to sit down and do it, and you don't want to sit down and do nothing. I'm like, well, yeah, that's true, too. So, and so I created a whole thing of um, girls, and I thought it was awesome, and I used them, try to use them in my presentation. So if you want to follow me, I'm on Twitter. And I don't like Facebook, thank God. I don't mess with Facebook. <laughs> um, I do Instagram, and if you want to help me, I am looking for Android developers to help me build my Pivo app. Because I had it, my son actually built it for me for um, Android. And then this whole privacy settings thing went into effect, and then they removed it or for Android. My, husband, my son decided he's not going to help me no more build my app. And I told him, dude, they will hire you for a job. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do that. So now he's an um, a IT assist, um, system administrator. He's, still, he's in the computer like mommy. 
You know, the other two girls, I don't know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> but um, I would love for you to, to help me build um, the PIVO Purple Evolution app for, um, for um, domestic violence. I'm doing it. First, I'm going to start national, and then I want to go international. I have people who actually contact me, Australia, um, India, Canada, and South America. So, um, and so I'm going to, this is my favorite part of my presentation, is um, I'm doing a conference, I mean, I'm doing a coding boot camp in Atlanta in October. And I'm hope, and I want to do 100 girls. And we're trying to help 100 girls learn how to code. And from there, we want to also continue on mentoring them and so that they can continue on learning how to code so they can enjoy doing it and can maybe get a job for their future. So this is something that I'm really working on. I realize that even though I inspire a lot of people, I need to inspire my girls. I need to get more girls involved. I want to change the number. I want to be, I, I keep telling, I want to change the world. I want to be that person to change the numbers of women that's in technology right now. So that's me. And guess what, Tim Cook? Ah! <laughs> it's so cool. Okay, okay, okay. So this, this is the, the end of the story, okay? All right, so I'm at, I'm at WWDC 2017. And I was like, ooh, and these kids that are already attacked him at the, at the scholarship, and I can't get next to him for nothing in the world. So I was like, so I was like damn, um, in fact, oh, Michelle Obama was there, and I wish I had met her, and I didn't get to meet her. But what happened was, I was like, man, I'm standing there, and I was like, man, I need to, I want, a, I want a picture of Tim Cook. I want a picture of Tim Cook. I'm never going to come back here again. I need a picture of Tim Cook. So I was like, fuck it. So I walked up there, and I was like, and all these people around, I said, hey, Tim. He said, hey, Alicia. I was like, you know who I am? He said, of course I know who you are. <laughs> I said, can I get a selfie? He said, yes, you can get a selfie. And again, voila. That's the selfie. Yeah, right there. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And... Coughlin, I thank you for inviting me again. I love this. This is, I'm getting goosebumps. This is crazy. This is some crazy. Look what you're doing to me. Good thing I ain't crying. I'm emotional. I'll be starting to cry right now. So thank you, Coughlin Conf. Um,